Good evening, everyone. I think we're waiting on a few more people potentially, but we're going to just be respectful of everyone's time. We said we'd start at 7 o'clock, so we are going to do so. So um, I'm Tracy Wheeler. I am the superintendent of Berea City Schools, and I want to begin tonight by thanking all of you for being here. This evening gives the district the opportunity to share with you the safety and security measures that we have in place in order to protect our students, staff, and our school buildings. School safety is always our number one priority for our schools and events that take place around the country far too often highlight the importance of school safety. So before we begin with Mr. Draves and our panel, I wanna take a few moments to thank some people and recognize some people who are here. So if I call your name, I want you to just stand up and give a, a, a wave. Um, we have the, I think the fire chiefs from all three cities here. So fire chief uh, Ledwell, there he is. Um, the acting fire chief, Pat Johnson. And then our fire chief, Bryant Galgus. Thank you for being here for him. So these are the fire chiefs from all three of our cities. So thank you for being here tonight. In addition, when we talk about our safety forces and the, and the group of people that we work with, we work very closely with our fire and our police. Police. So I don't know that of all of our chiefs, are they here? So our Berea, um, uh, P, Berea PD Chief um, Dan Clark. I didn't see him. Is he here? His son has football practice. Okay. Um, the Middleburg Heights PD Chief Ed Toma. And then our Brook Park Acting PD, our Acting Chief is Chief Ed Powers. There he is. Ed's in the back if you wave again. Thank you for being here. Also want to recognize, I don't think they're here tonight, but again, some of the folks that when we talk about the work that we do, um, we also have constant contact and communication with the safety directors from the three cities. So it's Tom Sensel from Brook Park, Barb Jones from the city of Berea, and Matt Castelli acts as the safety director for the city of Middleburg Heights. So again, those three members are also included in things that we talk about when we do talk about our, our uh, um, safety and security. I also want to take a minute tonight to recognize our board members that are here. So I know Mr. Rick Mack is here, our board vice president, Corey Ferris, and our board president, Anna Chapman. So we also, in addition to the ha that, have um, many of our members of our administrative, we have an administrative team of about 35 people, and I know that some of them are here tonight. So any of our administrators in the district, just stand or wave your hand. Most of them are in the back. They're worse than elementary school kids who hide. So again, um, I think what's important for the for the non-school or, or safety force people that are here tonight to understand that when we have all of these people in the room and when we talk about safety and security in our district, these are the people that are in the room, that how for you all to know how important we are about this and how serious we are in, in what we do in planning. And you know when they talk about it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a village to ensure the safety of our child, of all of our children. So we recognize the need for this presentation tonight and the importance of the work that we do for the communication that we have with our community stakeholders because each and every day you trust us to keep your most prized possessions safe and that's your children. So at this time, so we can get started with the actual presentation, I want to introduce Mr. Mike Draves. He's the Assistant Superintendent of Schools and he's our acting business manager right now. And when we do, uh, we started lots of work on this three years ago when we came in the district and Mr. Draves really heads up all of the work that we do with both our large group and our small group safety uh, committee work. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Draves. I'd like to recognize three more people too that are here that are really, really important and goes to the core of what Bria City Schools is about. Um, our, 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 the heads of all of our unions are here. Um, Dave Yakimo from our transportation department, Brian Kessler from Teachers, and Meg Schreffer uh, from OPSI is here. And it just speaks to the partnership that the administration and our, and our labor unions have. And I can't appreciate it you guys being here tonight and, and for this, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, May, in May, the end of May, uh, Uvalde um, happened 
and Robb Elementary School, and it was an emotional day everywhere in America, obviously. Um, our teachers were upset, our parents were upset, and, and many of our kids who, who saw the news, obviously, were scared and nervous as well. And so um, it was, at, I think, right around then that Tracy said, we really do need to do something to um, talk to our community about what we do, because if you don't tell them, they don't know. And so that's what today is. Um, invited everyone who serves on our district large group committee. So many people who are here today actually serve a purpose as kind of a, a sounding board um, for the community to bring to us concerns that the community would have. Um, so decided to have kind of two birds with one stone. We created a safety presentation, um, a safety report. Um, we have a brilliant um, community relations and marketing person in our district. If you haven't met her, uh, Mrs. Christina Capretta, she's in the back taking pictures. But she said, we really need to create a safety report that talks about what we do. First part tonight, I'll talk a little bit about this, about our safety report. What are the things that we do to try to ensure safety as, as best we can? The second part is really who I wanted you guys to meet, which, so there's an ulterior motive, but I, is I wanted you to meet the the individuals who do work daily to keep our kids and our staff safe in our buildings. And I tell you, we have some good ones. And so I'm excited for, for you to be able to, to listen to them today and uh, to hear a little bit about it. Um, the, after the, um, we will take questions at the end. I, I realize that people might have come tonight because they have questions about what's going on. The one thing that that every one of these guys will tell you too, is we have a growth mindset with regards to safety and security. We get better. Um, and, and so there's always room for improvement. In fact, after, unfortunately, after every one of these tragedies, we learn something new. And we, we do a lot of post-action report work, talking with each other, incidents that happen in other districts, and we bring that. And so at the end, there might be an opportunity for you to share things that you might want us to think about, and we welcome that feedback. That's how we get better. Uh, the faces in this slide say it all. Um, we continually are investing in risk management tools and developing in proactive uh, management plans in our district for prevention, to mitigate, to prepare, to respond, and to reunify. Um, together with our law enforcement and our first responders, um, we evaluate these post events so that we can grow. That's the purpose. <laughs> School safety touches many departments and can range from managing parental communication um, to determining necessary mental health services for victims and families in times of crisis, making difficult decisions. These decisions obviously must be made quickly. The more you drill, the more you practice, the more that you think about these things, the more prepared you'll be. Why this is important to me as an educator is Maslow's hierarchy of need states that a kid really cannot learn unless they feel safe. And so that's why we do the work that we do um, to try and make sure that every kid when they come in the school building has a safe environment to learn. That's our goal. Especially true in school, it's why our staff dedicates so much time to training each year. Uh, school safety and security is largely about prevention and planning ahead, uh, meaning that the school safety training for all our Berea City School District employees is essential. There's no single solution to the threat of violence in schools, nor the mental health challenges that present are present in today's world. We believe in a layered approach that inclu includes coupling strong security measures, along with uh, ensuring that all students, all students feel welcomed and supported. This report uh, highlights safety improvements and our commitment to student safety. This is not the school from 20 years ago. This is the post-Columbine era. Columbine was in 1999. From that moment forward, and the officers, some of them have gray hair to prove it, um, have, have, we've really changed what we've gone from, from in schools. It's become much more of a secure environment. We talk about safety regularly. What we used to just have is fire drills. Now we have safety drills. And that might include preparing for a tornado. That might include 
a chemical spill out on Bagley that might include a, uh, some other accident that happened where we have to go into a lockdown. So we prepare for all different types of things. It's not what it was 20 years ago, it's different. 10 years ago, we started with our ALICE training, and many of the educators in the room will remember that, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. We've since switched to a, a, what we believe, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, in, in, in connection with our police and fire services, has recommended we go to the run, hide, fight protocol, and we've gone through implementing that, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Training, staff training, uh, prevention and preparedness. Uh, we have on just, I want to kind of go through some of the things that you might not know that we have to do um, or that we do with our staff to make sure they're prepared. Uh, Public School um, Works is, is, is our online portal that we use for a lot of different things to make sure that our staff is trained yearly. We've done a much better job in making sure that this is done um, before school starts, of which I can report, we are uh, right at 100% compliance as of this afternoon, which is a, is a great feat. Um, we learn about things like bloodborne pathogens, discrimination, harassment, uh, bullying, about um, our run, hide, fight procedures and how to keep our kids safe at school. We are required um, to have very detailed emergency management plans um, for the district and for our school buildings. Um, we have a plan of action for fire drills. We have a plan of action for evacuations, bomb threats, weather emergencies, chemical spills, evacuations, active shooters. Uh, when I arrived here in 2019, Berea City School District was actually way ahead of the curve, um, calling all of their drills safety drills, whether it was a fire drill or an active shooter. If it can happen, they had a plan for it, and we continue to do that, and we continue to evaluate it. Each year, we were required to have a theoretical safety drill, a tabletop, of, or a full scale. This year, I'm proud to announce that we're looking at doing a full scale drill uh, in, in the month of June. If it can happen, we have to be prepared for it. We work with our SROs and our admin to continually update and revisit our plans. We are constantly trying to learn from each other in our post-action reports when a situation arises in another district, and we often talk about how we would handle this ourselves. We record everything in um, Navigate 360. This is, um, so technology has come, come along as well. So we have the ability to, uh, every, every employee can have this downloaded app on their phone, call loose, call lists, maps, floor plans, flip charts, safety charts, the reunification plan. So if it, obviously in times of crises, it might not be at the forefront of what you're thinking about, but you have the ability to access that. And so we've worked hard to try and make sure that we have that as well. Fortifying our buildings um, as best we can. It's a daily struggle, we know that. Um, we ask individuals to buzz into our buildings and identify who they are and what their purpose is for coming into the school. Verify that it's them as they buzz into the office, and once they're in the office, sign in and uh, receive a badge to wear um, so that we know that they're supposed to be in the building. Working really hard with our SROs, if they see an adult in the building who's not wearing a badge, to make sure that they're going up and asking them where their badge is and um, walking them back to the main office so they can get checked in properly if they've somehow gotten through. It's very important that when we, we have people who are vetted coming into our buildings. One of the things that, that we've learned is that we can't do this alone. So, and if you look back a lot of the tragedies that have happened in America, unfortunately, there was information there that if it was shared, perhaps could have stopped some of this. So we'll always take an email, we'll always take a phone call, share it with us, but if you're uncomfortable doing that, we do have anonymous tip line available um, to be able to do that. Um, it's the 844 Safer Ohio site. Um, every we get a couple of those every year that come to the site that come directly to Mrs. Wheeler and myself, so that we can then act on that information. They also 
Um, it's done through the state of Ohio. They also will check up on that information to make sure that you, that you followed up on it. What we emphasize, what I want you to emphasize to your kids is if you see something, say something. If you, even if you think it's foolish, say something. Find an adult. Find Mr. Cummins over at the middle school in fifth grade and say, hey, that, that door wasn't locked right there and I saw that guy come in. Let him know. Um, th those kinds of things could be the difference. And so if you see something, make sure that you say something. Talk to your kids about that too. There's this idea that they don't want to be a snitch. Well, they could be a hero. Um, and so make sure that they let someone know. It doesn't have to be in public. But if we, know that if we don't know about it, we can't deal with it. Our visitor procedures, um, when parents buzz, our office staff will, staff will greet them, ask them to identify themselves, the purpose for their visit. They finally are there and buzzed in the building. I often hear, and I, I know there'll be a parent who might even bring it up. Um, you know, they, they buzzed me in and they didn't ask who I was. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is um, we're work, we're, we work every day to make sure that we're doing that. Number two, I will tell you, um, our secretaries know more people than you know. <laughs> they, they know a lot of the people, um, but not okay. We still want to go through and make sure that we are um, asking, checking, verifying um, before we let individuals in our building. Accessibility um, to our buildings. Um, we keep our doors locked, continually uh, retraining and trying to get better um, at this. Um, Every time, I know our SROs have been extremely diligent this year about going around and checking our doors, letting me know if, if a staff member is propping something open, they've been on that because we've emphasized it time and time again. So um, we're, we're looking to make sure that our entrances are fortified as, as best that we can. All of our buildings are locked and we have an extensive camera system as well. In, in a lot of our buildings. And I'll talk a minute about kind of what our hope is uh, moving forward. Uh, a few of our buildings we hope to prioritize some possible grant monies to be able to improve some of those camera systems and some of our old, older facilities. The, the high school and, and BPE's uh, camera systems are phenomenal. Um, grindstones is also good, can be better. And, and we, we know that we, we have camera systems at uh, Big Creek in the middle school as well, but we would like for them to be even more robust, something that we're going to look at. Plans and procedures to mitigate threats. So we do practice our run, hide, fight. Within the first three days of school, our SROs hold a staff meeting and go over. Um, our SROs go over that not only with the kids, um, in the elementary schools, more than likely in smaller, smaller classroom sizes. And in our high school, they'll go over that at, at their class meetings. We also have made our, in, our own in-house video, uh, run, run, hide, fight video, of which many of the officers up there are stars in that video if you want their autograph later. Um, but, but we've done that and we drill. You know, one of the things that I learned from, from these gentlemen up front was they're throwing different situations at our staffs all the time. I, there, when we first started this, it, it, every time you went into a, um, a active shooter situation, the teachers were barricading. <laughs> Why? That was the simplest thing to do, right? Keep everyone here, we close the doors. That's, that's different now. We're trying to put them through the paces so they're actually thinking about what are we trying to do to stay safe. And we don't tell them what the drills are going to be, and we want to see what their reactions are. That's how you drill. Um, so we've done a good job at growing um, with that and practicing um, as if um, you know we, their people's lives are on the line. So and that and that's really been a great step that we've had. This is the poster. Um, that hangs in every, every classroom in Berea City Schools. Um, run, hide, fight. Run, if it's safe, if it's a safe path uh, is available, run. Do not hesitate, get out. Leave your belongings, do not attempt um, to move injured people. Hide is the second option. To, if you cannot get out safely, hide. Be quiet and silence your phone. Block entrances and lock doors and stay out of view. We've actually, and I know we've done this in a lot of our buildings, is uh, find a hard corner, is find the area 
where the shooter won't be able to see in that we have uh, people over there, which has grown, right, guys? I mean, that's been a little bit different where it used to be spread out. And we've kind of, every time, unfortunately, we go through these situations, as I said, we learn something. And so we began to talk about hard corner, getting away from sight, um, from where a possible shooter could be. Fight, no one likes to hear this option, but quite frankly, you know, these three things is what, is what we hope you emphasize to your kids. We don't want that to be the option, but if all else fails, fight like heck to, to, to save yourself. Um, if your life's in danger, fight. Try to disable the threat, use improvised weapons, and fight like your life de depends on it. This is a last resort, obviously. The first and most important thing is use those legs and run. It's tough to talk about, but it's important that we reemphasize those messages consistently to our kids. As I say, we do have to we we have to put our our drills in. So it's it, this isn't something that a school district can ignore. There's actually penalties and fines that come if you're not following your safety drills. I'm proud to say that we go above and beyond what we need to do. We have four district standard ones where we do it every week in the buildings the same time so that Mrs. Wheeler and I can come around and see what the drills are. We can see how we're practicing. We can evaluate. But we also know that they're going to be getting done and they're going to be conversations in your homes on those weeks, which is really important to us too, to follow up uh, at home talking to your kids. We do more than what we need to. Um, this presentation, by the way, will be online. Um, Mrs. Capretta probably already put it onto the website. But if you want to look at the run, hide, fight video that the district made, it is on there for you guys to view. I'm not going to show it right now. I really can't thank our partners enough. Um, we are as strong as our, as our SRO help and our, our, our uh, firefighters, our safety forces. Our three communities are amazing. Uh, I probably couldn't single one out better than the other. They're all great. Uh, Brook Park, Berea, and Middleburg Heights. Um, we're so very thankful for them. You see here that we have at Berea Mid Park High School uh, three officers, uh, Officer Chuck Goot, uh, Officer Dennis Bort, and Vader, um, the dog, um, are, are there at the high school. At Berea Mid Park Middle School in Big Creek in Middleburg, we have really um, five individuals who, who rotate in those positions. Officer Danny Riley, Paul Swisher, Officer George Rosh, uh, Officer Jack Darnell, who's here today, and Officer Jason Ponicky. Um, and then at Grindstone Ele Elementary, um, Dave Kammerman, and at Brook Park, Officer George Kozolowski uh, uh, at Brook Park, um, uh, from Brook Park Police Department. Now, thank you guys, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk to them here in a second. George, did I butcher your name? I'm sorry. <laughs> this was, you know, we talk about the whole child and making sure that there, there is a connection between mental health and um, violence in, in, in the United States. That's a fact. So the reality is we do our due diligence to try and make sure that we're addressing mental health concerns and needs in our schools. We've gone to great lengths to do that, uh, bringing in family support specialists. Uh, we have 15 um, school counselors, seven and a half school psychologists, uh, one board certified uh, CBA, um, and five family support specialists, 47 staff that are trained in threat assessment, and 74 crisis response teams members. So and it's impressive. Um, we went through extensive training this summer in threat assessment. It's mandated by the state of Ohio, but Berea was way ahead. Berea was doing this in 2018. Threat assessment training, if you paid attention in Parkland, could have possibly stopped that. Um, threat assessment training, looking at the whole child, everything about the kid, getting a multidisciplinary team together, to look at all aspects of what's going on with that kid and talking about that to decide what level of threat that that kid could be in school. So really proud that that work's being done. We have intact threat assessment teams at all of our buildings uh, and we're sending more people to be trained uh, in the next couple months. Um, Ms. Lori Sanson has led that work for us. Thank you, Lori. 
What can parents do? Um, number one, thank you for being here. That says, says all it really needs to, that you guys care about this. You could have been at home watching TV or something tonight, but uh, you care enough to be here, and that means a lot to the school district. Um, and I can actually tell how it's evolved. In the, we did this three years ago, and we had like four people show up. So I, it is on people's minds, and it matters. And so I really appreciate you guys coming tonight. What can you do? Number one, talk to your kids. Be safe. Uh, tell someone if you see something um, before an incident happens. Let us know about it. There'll be a lot of times where parents will say, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Please let us know. How you shouldn't let us know is on Facebook. How you, how you should let us know is by giving us a call. Um, and anyone who wants my card, come get it at the end. I'll be glad to give that to you. That's how we'd love to have that information. What happens during it? Don't call or text them. Phone could ding, phone could go off, and I know that's hard to say. Um, but pay attention to alerts from the school district and we'll tell you what to do. Um, stay out of the cops' way, stay out of the firefighters' way. Um, if God forbid something like that were to happen, we do have uh, rally points and reunifications and the kids all know where those are at. Um, and you would be alerted as to where to go if, God forbid, that were to happen. Grace, I guess I have it up here. <laughs> Grace Church, uh, which is in, uh, it's, on, it's on Pearl Road in Middleburg Heights. Where are we going? So this is an interesting year. Coming out of Uvalde, I will tell you, there's, there's money available to improve what we do. And... So tomorrow, uh, actually this week, I'll be meeting with every building principal and SRO in their building, and we do a vulnerability assessment. So we go through and uh, we, we'll fill out a questionnaire together, we'll walk the building, and find out where our vulnerabilities are. There are some, and we want to fix them. Um, so hopefully that's what this monies can do. We were successful already in getting uh, 50000 for uh, BMMS, of which we are going to, we're putting it into um, improve their camera system uh, even more than what it is. We will have the ability to apply for another 50 at the middle school and 100,000 dollars for all of our other schools. 53 million put aside by the feds that's given to the state of Ohio for this, and we're working with uh, Tim Del Vecchio from the Ohio School Council to help us write these grants. We hope to be successful in doing that. Even new buildings like. Um, Berea Mid Park High School and Brook Park Elementary will be eligible for the money. The key, what we've been told, is to write the narrative so that you are addressing your need in the facility with what the vulnerability says, and that's what we intend to do. Looking to improve um, with our fire partners in extending the, uh, just talked with uh, Chief Galgus um, from Middleburg about um, stop the bleed training, um, so tourniquet training uh, in our classrooms, and Officer Goot's been working, um, trying to help us find a partner um, to be able to help us with that training with all of our staff, working on go buckets in our classrooms um, so that we have things in the classroom if, God forbid, we're in, a, we're in a prolonged lockdown. So those are just a couple of the things that, that we're working on this year. There is, there is oversight too, so it's not like I do whatever I want or that the SROs do whatever they want. We have a small group and large group um, oversight, so we, our small group committee, administrators and SROs, uh, our next meetings are November 10th, uh, February 3rd and June 8th this year, and then we've set up our large group committee, of which if, if anyone's in the large group, could they raise their hand here tonight? So we got quite a few people in the large group. September 13th, October 27th, and April 19th. April 19th, the large group will bring to us um, concerns, things that they've seen. Um, is, even though you might think it's minor, it's not. We need to bring it to the table and try to address it. We have a board member, uh, Mr. Rick Mack, will sit in on both our small group and large group meetings. Um, our, our, our school board takes school safety very seriously as well, and so he's been... He's been um, Great serving on that committee. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Really, um, 
the, the purpose behind here, as I said, I wanted you guys to meet these individuals here this evening. Our SROs work daily to make sure that um, our staff and students are safe. And so Mrs. Capretta put out to the community some questions that, that the community had. Um, and so I thought we would start with them answering some of these questions. You guys just, I think you might see some of the questions apply to some of you, um, but feel free to jump in. Just remember to hit the red button when you talk because we are, uh, this is gonna be posted online. The first thing, just each of you guys, if you just take a minute or two and tell us a little bit about um, about what your role is in the, I guess tell us your name, where you're at, how long you've been on the job uh, as an SRO, and um, you know a little bit about what you perceive your role as as a, as a school resource officer. We'll start with you, Officer Bort. No. Okay. There you go. Now I got it. There we go. Yeah. All right. Now we got it. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm a Dennis Port, uh, Berea Police, been an officer for 32 years. Uh, this is a new role for me this year, but I've been in school security since like 2018. I've been a pretty steady presence in the old building and transitioning into the new. So really, um, I mean, obviously, other than the security and the, the safety and 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 neutralizing any threats that would come into the school. It's just to interact with the kids and have them see you in a positive light, and like not just getting like pulled over or dealt with in an official capacity. Um, and, and that tool, you know, my dog here is great at that. He's a great icebreaker for the kids, you know, and they feel free to come into my office. They want to pet him. Sometimes he wants to be petted. Sometimes he don't. But you know, they're, they're, learn they're all learning it together. Um, and uh, so for me, you know, I mean, my youngest graduated high school last May from Brunswick. So I'm not too far removed from having kids in the school, but I still know some of the lingo, okay? And I've always, you know, coached youth wrestling, uh, lacrosse, and things like that. So, you know, the biggest thing is if you care about these kids, um, they know it, and they respond to it, and they see you in a different light than just somebody in the uniform. So that's what I like to bring to it. Thank you. Hi, Officer Gu with Berea Police Department, and I'm in my 30th year with the department, and then this is my sixth full school year as the SRO at Berea Mid Park High School. Um, I'll expand upon a little bit what um, Officer Board has stated. You know, our the number one priority for the SRO is the safety and security of the staff and students inside the school. That's our, that's our main priority, but as you can imagine, day to day throughout the nine months, you know, we're, it goes far, much farther than that. And what we quickly realize is that building the relationships with our students helps us out in the aspects of keeping that school safe. So your arguments that occur day to day between students and building the relationships and making them understand that we're trying to create a safe atmosphere um, is what we're really all about on a minute to minute and day to day basis. Um, building those relationships so they feel free to come and tell us if they've heard something, if they heard that there's going to be a problem, if they heard that there's a threat. Um, those are the things that we're trying to go ahead and do every single day. And um, I think that we have have those things happening here at Berea Mid Park High School. Um, Dennis is, was part, we were partners together in the Detective Bureau for 11 years, so we have a great working relationship that's going to carry over to this you know, atmosphere. Um, and I think hopefully your students, if you ask them about SRO Goot and SRO Bort, they'll tell you what kind of relationship they have with the SROs at the high school and how we're building those relationships. Officer Dave Camberman, I'm uh, uh, the SRO over at Grindstone Elementary. Um, I'm in my 22nd year um, with the Berea Police Department. I've been with Grindstone. Um, in the past, uh, Grindstone has used, we had part-timers um, working uh, at Grindstone as SROs. Um, we had some retirements, and last year I kind of phased into it, uh, working at Grindstone. This year I'm there full-time, uh, five days a week. Um, I love what I do. Um, I love working with the kids. Um, you know, it's, it's a different animal working at the high school as opposed to working at the grade school. I've done last year, I kind of subbed in a couple of times when Chuck wasn't there, worked at the high school, worked at the grade school. 
Um, you know, and, and again, it's, it's about building those, those relationships. I, my children are, are, are younger. My son is in eighth grade. My daughter's a senior at the high school. Both of them went through Grindstone. I know the, uh, staff very well. So I work well with the staff. Um, you know, there to greet the kids in the morning. They see a friendly face. Um, last year after you talked about Uvalde, you know, I had kids come up to me and say, I know why you're here, you know, and, and that was, that was kind of sad. Um, but, and, but I like, you know, I'm always here, bud, you know, I'm here, bud. keep you safe. And, um, that's all. Hello, my name is Officer George Kozakowski. I've been with the Brook Park Police Department for approximately 25 years. Uh, this is my seventh year as the SRO over at Brook Park Elementary. Uh, prior to that, I was a, between the two schools that we did have in Brook Park, and then they merged into one. Um, and just building on what my colleagues said, uh, the biggest part that we try to do, especially at the elementary level, is beginning those and fostering those relationships with the little ones. So as they grow and then we send them off to the middle school and then to the high school that they do feel comfortable with the police and coming to us with the problem instead of going away from us or hiding from us. So again, you know, in, in respect to, you know, fostering those relationships, we also try to do some curricular things with them, you know, in the beginning of, you know, what's good and what's bad between drugs and so forth like that and alcohol and we, you know, whatever hot topic of what was going on in society, we try to talk about that and talk through that and understand what their process is and how we could talk things out. Uh, and that's about, you know, what we also bring to the table here. Hello, I'm Jason Ponicky. I've uh, been with the Middleburg Heights Police Department since 2020. Before that, I was with the city of Maple Heights as a police officer for a little over 13 years. Um, and when I was getting hired in, they asked if I'd be interested in uh, the school resource position. And I was absolutely uh, wanting to do something like this. I have younger kids. Um, so anything with the elementary or the middle school was pretty much up my alley. Uh, I really do enjoy being part of the, the middle school, the older ones. Uh, they can be challenging at times, um, but my wife and I, we coach uh, volleyball, baseball, basketball at the Middleburg Rec and at their schools, uh, so we do like to be involved. I like to know who's in the community, um, bridge that gap. Some come from tough backgrounds, some come from great backgrounds, and just kind of meld them and, and you know, help them understand that the police are not all bad. Some think that, um, but you know, after a year or so with with us, I, I think they understand that we're not we're not bad people. We're just trying to do what's best for them. Um, and I think towards the end of the year, they really get that. Uh, that's kind of all. Um, Officer Darnell. I've only been a police officer 10 years, so one of the bunch. Um, <laughs> uh, I work at the middle school as a school resource officer. I've been working with the schools for about four years now. In addition to all those things, one of the great things we're able to do is act as a resource for the staff and the administrators, uh, how the criminal justice system can uh, apply to the school aspects and how it can negatively impact or positively impact certain situations that young people might find themselves in. So, and then it's also a great avenue for families to recognize that we're just an additional resource. Again, calling 911 seems intimidating for some families. They don't think they need to go there and having access to a police officer in a different setting, you know, can help them work through problems. So it's another avenue that we have to access families. These, these gentlemen, um, so I first need to say our school board has committed to making sure we have an SRO in every building, which I will tell you that's that's not happening in every school district, so kudos to our school board for that because they realize the importance of safety. I will, I will also say that um, they're right. They, these guys are resources to us. I can't count the times on a weekend where we get a call about a child being suicidal where I call one of the officers and they drop everything to, to either go out and check themselves or call someone who's on because they know someone who's on who can go do that. Um, 
there's been times where Officer Goots offers, he's answered the phone and he's in Florida, <laughs> and I didn't know he was on vacation, but he still helped me out, which I appreciate. So it, it, it's been great. This question I think is for Dennis and Chuck and maybe a little bit for me. This was from one of the parents online. Um, why do we need two SROs at the high school? Or why do we, maybe should say, why do we have two SROs at the high school? Uh, I think in, when you look at this from an operational standpoint, there's, there's a lot of positives to having more than just one, especially in this institution. Number one, take a look at how large it is. So I did do it for five and a half years all by myself, which it can, it could be done. However, if I left, then they had to try to fill that spot to have someone come in. When you're talking about police departments and manpower and issues of that nature, um, it does make it difficult to try to put someone in a spot that's, you know, that they don't, they're not counting on for a day or two days or seven days, depending. So when we, when we look at it that way, we want to try to have someone in this building all the time. Uh, you know, it's a necessary resource, and so does the district, um, to have us here um, on a daily basis and not have and make sure that someone is here. Um, and then if you look at it from what we've done this year and what the district has done, um, and I will tell you that they've our partnership is amazing, and their partnership just this year alone, and where we um, put. Officer Bort and his office, um, which is right at the educational side of this complex. Um, you know, when we were figuring it out, we knew that strategically it was gonna be a great thing. And then once he's here and we start to see um, the relationships that immediately started with him being in that position and uh, our, your, your children and our students walking and coming to his office and just talking to him, that having two people here is amazing success. So um, on all levels. That's my perspective. I don't know if Officer Board. Your kids like that I have snacks in my office. That's a big thing. Okay, <laughs> Let's, we'll start with that. Um, but I mean, I'm watching Chuck running around, I mean, just one side of the building the other. And, and when I was in the, in the parking lot security, I would come in to get the radio. And many times I just wouldn't even leave until it was time to do the buses. Okay, so, you know, it, it was just, there was, the need was there. You know, the vast majority of the kids in this building are outstanding. There's always a small percentage that don't want to be here and make it known. And then sometimes, you know, there's little <laughs> brush fires that come up and they all seem to come up at the same time in multiple locations. And, you know, we work really well with the, with the administration. You know, and it's just nice having that extra person in here that could, hey, okay, you could take more time to, res to have a resolution with this and I could go deal with that instead of you hurrying up with this, leaving it incomplete. And now, you know, you might have to deal with it later again. So it, it, it's, it's, I, I'd take three if, if you give, if you give me, okay. <laughs> but, but uh, we're, we're on the right path and, and, and I'm just happy to lighten up Chuck's load a little bit. I, I will tell you that the other day I was here and there were four police officers here. They actually have been encouraged by us to walk through, come through the building, say hi to the kids. And I think Tracy was like, we're not paying all four, are we? <laughs> no, they're, they're here just visiting, uh, but that we want that. And we want the kids to come in or the kids to see our officers. And so um, that, that, that's actually been a really positive thing. You're right, more is better. And uh, we, certainly, we certainly appreciate all the, all the support that you guys give us. This is a question that, you know, I, I think the heart of this from, from one of the parents is probably what makes you guys, what makes a good SRO, how are you trained? And then maybe think about it too from the standpoint of what, I don't know if every, every police officer can be an SRO. You, you guys are kind of special about, and I mean that in the nicest way, <laughs> that it is, it's true, be, the way that you guys interact with kids, the way that George and, and Dave get emotional when they talk about kids after the Uvalde thing. Um, just talk a little bit about the role of an SRO, how you, how you do that, and you know, what, why, why it's such a special role as an officer. Anyone? No, was not, sorry. <laughs> um, being an SRO, it, it's, it's kind of like being a big brother, being a coach, being a parent, all rolled into one. Um, it, it, it's caring about the young children, caring about all the students, and wanting the best thing for them, and doing what it takes to achieve that goal. So it, it's kind of a blend of everything. And then you throw the aspect of being a law enforcement officer. 
Um, when I first started, it was DARE. So I went to DARE school, and that was you know 80 hours of training. And then on top of it was SRO training, which was another 80 hours. And everybody thinks when you first come out of the police academy, you're, you're the big bad police officer. You're going to go, I got the Superman cape, and I'm going to go change the world. I'm going to shake the pillars of heaven. I, w I want the best for everybody. But then you develop these walls. So what these schools teach you is to bring down these walls, understand that we're all human beings, understand that we all have feelings and it's okay to express that. So when the little kid comes up to you or the little student says, you know, and they ask that hard question or they ask a question about you personally, you don't take it personal. You kind of, you know, have fun with it, laugh at yourself. And it's okay to be open and express yourself. That's my take. Anyone else? Jack? Looks like you want to say something. Uh, again, just in addition to, the, to paint the picture a little bit of what that training looks like for officers that go through that additional 80 hours of training, there's special legal training. There's legal considerations for dealing with youth. There's legal considerations for dealing with youth in schools. And then there's additional crisis intervention training and just additional skills that they're, that we are given because we're in this different role. It's a little bit of a, again, school resource officers generally are dealing with things by themselves without backup. I mean, making an arrest is not necessarily a, a valid option for you. So you have to come up with different problem solving aspects. And so some of your tools as a police officer get taken away and these schools give you new tools and new options to work with. And I just want you to touch for a second because I, I think it helps clarify um, our officers. Jack, can you just talk a little bit about what you did over the summer with training with officers and kind of how your, your time in the school helped kind of foster that? So this summer, uh, my department supported me and I was able to work with a bunch of great organizations. And we put together uh, specialized training to help officers learn how to deal with special needs communities and allow special members of the special needs community to come in and learn how to interact with officers. Uh, there's definitely a gap between the expectations that officers have and the reality of what certain members of special needs communities are capable of doing in certain situations. Uh, so what we did is, you know, we took officers and we put them under a little bit of stress and we took members of these special needs communities that volunteered to be here. We put them under a little bit of stress and we practiced things like traffic stops and arrest procedures and interviews. And we, it, it really helped enlighten the officers that were able to attend as to what to expect and what to perceive and how to approach things. And in talking with some of the family members that came, they said the same thing. They said that their children were able to uh, experience something and get nervous and be a little bit uneasy in a more safe environment. And they were very grateful that the first time their child has an interaction with a law enforcement officer won't be out there on the road when there's a lot of unpredictability. And we were able to do it in a little bit of a safer environment. And I came up with that idea while working in the schools I built relationships with some students that have special needs, but you may not, uh, they don't present in, in the traditional way that you would think. Uh, so in interacting with them and building relationship, relationships with them, I was able to understand that, okay, he may be acting in a way that, you know, I, as an officer, I want to perceive, I would perceive as aggressive or threatening, but then having the full picture, I was able to say, no, this is a different situation and I can approach it differently. And I just kind of wanted to expand that experience to as many people as I could. So we're trying to work to grow that training option. So working with these gentlemen, I will tell you, the, I, when I talked about growth mindset earlier, it's because it's things like that, that they, they don't think they know everything. And I know that they know that we can always get better and they push us to do that. Um, so I appreciate that, that we're always working to get better. You guys have a captive audience and we're also being filmed and we'll probably cut this up for some Facebook clips. Uh, if you could tell parents uh, one or two things about um, what you would want them to know about school safety um, to our community, you know, if you guys all could think of something um, that you might want to share that since you have a captive audience. Here, okay, I'll go first before somebody takes my idea. Um, <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you're, you're the front line of school safety as a parent. Okay, you know your child better than any of us in this room. Okay, your kid can come to my office every day and talk. I won't know him one-tenth that, that you do. 
Okay, so you, you know it starts at home. You know, looking for that you know the cha- a change in friend groups, a change in behavior, a change in interest. You know, a, a kid who is normally really happy all of a sudden has is having issues, and you know what changes their personality completely. You know that that's something that starts there. So be be aware of the changes of it's your kid at home. You know, also you know be aware of what's going on with their uh, social media, like it or not. It's just it's here. It is what it is. You know, uh, uh, be aware of that. You know, be aware of their friend groups. Be aware of that stuff. And if you have a concern, bring it to us, and maybe we can you know, work together and prevent something before it even gets going. One thing that I'll add is that um, what we're trying to, this is at the high school level, so it's a little bit different elementary, but what we're trying to tell them here is that this is their community. Here, this is their high school. This is what they're gonna make of it for four years that they're here. So come, we know that by surveys and by talking to students, the vast majority, so we're talking about 98 to 99% want to come to a safe atmosphere. Doesn't mean that they even think about necessarily that it's in reference to school shootings or things like that, just that there isn't fights, that there isn't problems, that there isn't harassment, there isn't bullying. They want to come to a place where that doesn't occur. So for that, they, as anything else with law enforcement, can't do it ourselves. We need to rely on them. So to not be afraid to come forward, to say something, to tell a teacher, it doesn't have to be the SRO, it can be a teacher, it can be an administrator, it can be a guidance counselor, it can be anyone that they wish to share information about what's happening in their community. We're trying to get that across to them. So if you can support us in that and telling them, don't be afraid to say things. We know we say, see something, say something, but it can come down to what they feel they see someone is others, someone else is perceived as dealing with some bullying, some harassment, let us know. because. I would, the administrator, sir, will tell you we deal with all of that and just a lot of conversations about how to treat each other the way that we would like to be treated and that expectation, it'll make our community better. And that's for all of us, so we're, we're just trying to reiterate that to your, your children. That is one of the nice differences at the grade school um, because they're all tattletales there. Um, (laughs) Officer Dave, he said um, all sorts of stuff like that, but I digress. The the one thing I want to say is that, you know, the night Evaldi happened, um, I did not sleep. Um, Those were, you know, babies. Those were grade school children. Um, I was texting. you know, Tracy, when it happened, because you were at some kind of event and you didn't hear about it um, right away. And this district gets it, okay? Uh, the school district, they, they get it. They've bought into it. The departments have bought into it. We, we are very lucky to have what we have here. Um, and that was one of the, one of the only things I could take away from that night was knowing that, you know, Again, we're not perfect, but we always we are always trying. We are getting better. Uh, we are always learning. But what we have here is phenomenal compared to what some other districts have or don't have um, that uh, don't believe in it, or um, they wait uh, they wait to be reactive as opposed to being proactive. So um, that's what that's all I have. Just to build upon what everybody s- said so far is it, having those conversations with your child. The open line of communication to me is probably the most important between you and your family, you and your school district, you and your school resource officer, or whoever you feel comfortable with having that conversation, you know, regardless of whatever the topic is. I think communication is key. This is the only way that we can help each other. I'm going to add one thing because I always do. Um, I would I would encourage parents and teachers and students to understand that, in light of all these things, these things are all true. But also remind your kids that they are safe at school. The Uvaldi's and the tragedies happen, but they happen on such a small fraction of cases. 
it makes me sad when kids come to school and they're scared and they're terrified because they think Uvalde is going to happen to them. The reality is the chances that it's going to happen to them is so small that we need to remember that the adults can take that stress. That's our job. The men up here, that's what we do. Don't put that on our kids. Tell them that they're safe. Remind them that it's safe to go to school and it's okay. Yeah, I will add on to that. They read the parents. And so, and I, it's hard, right? I send my daughter to school and you want to make sure they're safe. And you're, you, I, was, I saw you all day and that, geez, that's she's the most important thing in my life. But it's a good point. We got to carry that and, and, and try to uh, send them there knowing that we have, we have uh, gentlemen like this there to, to help protect them. Um, so I appreciate that. You know, that we did our critical, our, our threat assessment training. I'll just, there's been 386 shootings on school property since Sandy Hook. So, I mean, it, I mean, it happens. Um, you're 10 times, I'll just tell you facts. You're 10 times more likely to get shot in a restaurant than you are at a school. You're 200 times more likely to get shot in your home than you are at a school. Um, these, are, these are facts, but it, it makes the nightly news and they're tragic. They're tragic. These are our kids. So we understand that and we work our butt off, but, um, and we, we do everything we can to try and make sure. That it's not saying that, God forbid, something could happen, right? But we're doing our darndest to be, and I like what the words that I think George used, proactive rather than reactive. We want to try and at least do our due diligence to make sure we're mitigating any possible threat if we can. That's the point. This is, um, you know, this is a question from on there. What, from a safety perspective, and I, I just think as you think maybe about globally uh, school safety, kind of what's the biggest challenge that we have uh, in trying to keep schools safe? I don't think you got to get too technical here, but does anyone want TikTok? <laughs> Social media certainly, I'm sure, does play a role, right? You guys have anything you want to answer for that? Uh, I'll say one of the. One of the biggest challenges is schools aren't meant to be, and we don't want them to be fortresses. We don't want them to be prisons. So one of the biggest challenges is how do you balance a welcoming environment with a safe environment? And they don't often, from our perspective as law enforcement officers and security-minded people, they don't often go together. If we wanted to make the schools perfectly safe, arguably we could. We could put big walls up and gates and fences and lock everything and make everything out of brick and steel. But that's not what we were on our kids to go to school. So that's one of the biggest challenges is, you know, you have to balance the purpose of a school with the goal of security and safety. And sometimes those things have a little bit of conflict. The, the, the research from that threat assessment training talked about putting metal detectors and create, there's a high school in, um, in, in Michigan that actually created a building with curved walls so a bullet couldn't go down more than 50 feet. Um, talking about extreme measures of putting in pods in every classroom that would lock so that no one could get into that pod. Um, what the research showed is that that actually caused more fear th than, than the kids going to school. And I think that's, that's to your point, Jack. I am going to open up the floor for any questions for either myself um, or for the officers, as I know uh, we're kind of about at the end here. But does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I got it. Dave? Cool. I'm Dave Yacht, mom, bus driver. I'm the student union president, okay? I go to all three schools. All right, now you guys are talking about training in the buildings. What about training on the buses? We have to set up something like that because there's a lot of things that happen on a bus. Come over and talk to the kids. Come over and talk to us and show that we're, we're united as a team. We have to set up something with a bus because, you know, there's a lot of people that are older. I'm 63 years old, you know. There's people that are older than me that drive cars. People are younger. You know, there's mostly women there. So you have to show them that you got their back. That's, that's a big thing. And, and because I hear all the time about stuff like that. And, 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 you know, like with us, like they say, I know me, 
I'm mean, all right? So if I seen a guy with, say, walking in with a gun, I'm taking that bus and taking him out. Who, who else is going to do that? I mean, that's what that bus is for. I mean, I, I'm taking him out because I don't want to see that kid, the bunch of kids get killed, all right? That was one of our brains things that we had a few years ago. I mean, other people aren't, you know? I don't know if I will. But to have the kids know that on the bus, we try to teach them that it's the same as in school, okay? You know what I know they want to be. But then, but if you guys and people come on and show it to them, maybe it's something in their head. I mean, I had the best thing I had when I first started here. I had my boys in the neighborhood in Sandstone for six years. From sixth grade to twelfth grade, I took them all up. up. I coached them. I knew them. Knew them since they were small. Everything like that. All them kids are in college. They come back from college, they see me, they go, hey, remember what you did on the bus? You know, or something, they're joking around. So he made a report with people. I have a group of students right now that I have 50 kids on the bus, elementary and grandson. You know how many kids I got on my bus. And it's hard to teach the kids the cross, especially the little ones. They're in kindergarten, first grade. When you got... 15, 20 kids getting off the bus. So I tried to have the parents help out. They helped out a little bit. Then I went up, there was hardly any parents there, and I said to the third and fourth graders, I go, hey guys, why don't you do me a favor? Have them cross the street. You guys take the charge of them. Hold your hands, hold them whatever, so that they don't run across the street. Did that for two days. This is the best thing I've ever seen. And that's just because you're talking to the kids and you're, you're making them feel. I go, like I told them this morning, I said, what you guys did was great. Can you do that again today? They go, oh, yeah, no problem. They did work better today. They probably felt like uh, big shots, right? They were uh, they were leaders, which is good. I mean, we, we are the first ones to see a kid. We're the first ones to drop them off. We've seen kids cry. We've seen, you know, all that stuff. I mean, so I'm just looking for... Like, if we're going to be a team, like, you know, you guys come around and say hi to us and stuff, so we get to know you too. That's a, that's a great point. You, and you guys want to? If I may, um, I'd be more than willing to come down to the bus garage and sit down with everybody whenever there's time with your entire staff. I know that might be some, you know, hard to do with your constant schedule of go, go, go Monday through Friday. But if we could set something up, I would be more than happy to come down, field any type of questions. Uh, and or concerns and we could talk through it and we could actually formulate a plan if you know whatever your concerns are um, and as far as the children go I think in training them and I know from my perspective because I help instruct safety town you know that's where you guys you've you've come down to safety town and we've talked about how to get on the bus how to act on the bus and I believe it starts at that age and then you know building it and I think that you did a great job in empowering the older children on your bus to help teach with the younger ones. I think that, you know, that peer relationship there is probably the best thing you could do to kind of maintain some of the sanity on there, I'm sure. Right, right. I have another question, too. Right. I'm a guy with questions, okay? And I'm not, I don't want to take anybody else's time or anything like that, but we do have, um, you know, I got that down. One thing, at Grindstone, I do not understand why do we go, there's cars parked on race, and why do we go next to them? That's unsafe. They're pulling the parking lot. I, I went yesterday to go down Fair Street by the board office. I was going to come back in that way to come in. It was, it was the street was blocked. That's not a one way street. You are talking, you are talking about safety, what if something happened with fire? How can they get in there all of a sudden these buses? I had three cars already come out and block. I'm going down the side of the street that I shouldn't be on. 
and they're, they're going this way. So who's going to win? Yeah, that happened once. Um, and it was we were training new uh, crossing guards, and they know now that they keep that, that driveway open, and the buses, if they see buses coming, they hold the buses from pulling out onto the street so buses can get into that. It's where the school is, we're in a neighborhood. It's, it's tough to do what we can do. That is a one-way street. It's considered a one-way street during those hours. We can't have cars coming the other way. Remember when it first opened, I was there, and the parents came in off the fair and cut in that way, and the buses came down on the right side of the street. When did this, this change? Because this is the first time I've been there in years. I, I'm not sure, Dave. I, I will be glad to set up, we can set up a time to talk well, uh, privately, okay? Well, mm -hmm. I, I'm just saying that, that to me, it's safety for the kids, the parents, everything else like that. We have a question here. Yes, sir. I've got several questions, but they're shorter. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to talk about a lot of the most recent events seem to happen in transitional spaces where activity is taking place and it's coming into the building. So has that been part of the risk assessment when you look at that? Because ordinarily up until this time, most everything has seemed to happen interior where it starts. But there's a transition that's taking place with some of these active shooters where it's starting outside. The second part of my question is related to that, and that comes to the architectural design, which I did submit a question about in the architectural design. But this is a great room to have this in, because I look at these windows and I think about activity happening on the outside and impacting on the inside, and I think this seems like a very distinct vulnerability to me. And I look at the band room, it's the same way with, with the large, you know, tall windows. And I know there's security films that could be added post-construction post that could potentially, you know, eliminate that or, you know, is there anything being considered in the design of that? And then I also want to bring in the fire department folks too because I think there's some important here. Um, we haven't heard from them. What training do the paramedics or do you have some type of like tactical medicine people that go with you on entry? Okay. Um, any of the chiefs want to answer that? We uh, met with the county um, emergency response uh, folks, the SRO, uh, George, Officer Kaz, uh, set up the meeting with us, and, and that's who we, uh, Brian Kloss is his name, and began to talk to him about setting up our own full scale to work those things between police and fire. Got a meeting uh, hopefully coming up soon with all of our uh, six area chiefs. Um, uh, Chief Powers was in, in that meeting that we discussed that with, with, with Officer uh, Kloss. Um, regard to the vulnerabilities, yeah, I anticipate the this building doesn't have many, but it does. That's one of them <laughs> that I would think would 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 stick out is um, the glass. And so there's ways to to be able to when I write the narrative based on the vulnerability assessment, I would assume that that's one of the things from this facility that would that would come out. Was there a first part too that did we miss that? Uh, just how how you prepare for or had. Have your tactics changed as you see the tactics of active shooters change such that you're seeing more of these events take place outside moving in? You know, whether it's in an outdoor commons area, whether it's an outdoor, um, you know, lunch area, things like that. Okay, um, so as far as training our students in reference to a threat that comes from the exterior, so if, if they were to be outside, that's very difficult for us to try. That we would have to create the, an actual simulated scenario, correct, which we don't want to put our students through that type of 
of you know training. So we, I think we know that it, it can occur. Um, the 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 run high fight protocols that we have here would apply in any situation that you have. So whether that is coming from the exterior, now, as soon as they would. Obviously, if there is something that occurs on our campus and you're hearing gunshots, that they know that the same protocols apply no matter where they're at here. Get to that rally point, get away from the threat, and you know keep themselves safe. Now, as you can, all of us can see that that threat usually is well, their goal is to get inside that building because that's where they feel they're going to do the most damage. So obviously we're fit, we're preparing for what we do inside of here as, as what most of the goals of those are going to be. Um, but we know that that can occur and we, we there's some things that we talk about. Most of that is, is going to be law enforcement related to how we're trying to act on something that's happening outside that building. Because uh, the people that are here on campus or in any atmosphere are going to be getting away from that threat. It's going to be a natural response. Hopefully, we, we did learn some things, and we as I will tell you, every cruiser in all three communities now has a has a general master key to be able to get into any door. We learning from the Uvalde incident, they can go right in. So the next week, uh, one of the officers said, "You know, we need keys. They got them. Like we sent them. Like yeah, you're right. <laughs> we learn, and so we're sending them to them. Um, and we're constantly doing those kinds of things, but." Uh, and I and I just think the way that you know one of the things that that worries me, especially as a high school, is there are transition times all the time. Going to Polaris, going to Tri C, going over to Baldwin Wallace to take. There, it is it's a it's in essence a kind of a college campus setup here, right? So there's always exterior things. I'm not sure we're able to ever really uh, change that. What I do want is I want our people to be more vigilant and paying attention and looking for keys and making sure that we see if there's a warning sign, our staff stopping people who don't look like they belong there, asking who they are, where's your pass, uh, where's your identification. Those are things that we can get better at and we continually drill. And these guys know it's been an emphasis of mine since the beginning of the school year where we're asking our adults to be better at this because it's important. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I've seen this happen um, numerous times where our officers, we ask our teachers to look at every, at their rosters and every class and consider the needs of their kids and then how they'll handle that during that class period. So all five or six of their classes, they're looking at how they're gonna do that. And I will tell you, I've seen it a lot. If they don't know what they're supposed to do, they go see one of our experts. And these guys are always willing to help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's true. No, they, they put them down, right? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, they have, they, some of them do have glass up at the top. Uh, yeah. What, we're, what we teach, right, is you've got to deal with the situation that you have. So you've got to find the hard corner. You've got to think about every period, every situation on how we're going to react to that. Run, hide, fight. Run, hide, fight. Thank you. I, I mentioned those. Yeah. I don't know if you're like looking for grants, but you know, we could also go to the end of community groups. Because I think that a lot of parents would be willing to say, I just, you know, if you decide what, what's in the bucket, like, I'm sure families, at least I know I would, be willing to say something before they start this to help out. Just a, you know, just a thought. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can even start with our PTAs. It's a great idea. Thank you. That's a great idea. I just want to add one thing to your concern. It's it's great that we have conversations at home, but also don't hesitate to include us. Bring your loved ones up to the police department, have those conversations with us, have those exposures to us so that, again, when they see the uniform, they can build that comfort. Uh, I, I know some families are a little hesitant, thinking that it's going to be a scary experience and stuff, but I think it's, again, anyone here, would welcome that interaction and most of our departments would welcome that so you're welcome to stop at any police department anytime but i work at middlebrook heights and if you wanted to bring your family members up um, i'm happy to have those interactions okay. yep absolutely bring them up and we'll have conversations and show them our car and turn on the lights or whatever they want to do that's cool thank you megan yeah Mrs. Grimm was a... Well, I will say, Megan, that's a great example. If, if you can, but share that with Mrs. Grimm so that she can... No, that's how we get better. That's good. Don't do that. I'll be watching you. So, Me Megan, you pointed out the first protocol is to we need to make sure we know who we're buzzing in. I, can, I encourage you to set up a meeting with Mrs. Krim so we can get better. Thank you. No, it's and Megan, that's, that's good. That's how we get better. Once they know who you are and why you're there. But if they buzz in, they're like, 
loves you and who says who you are and why you're there. If you don't have a reason for being there, they should never let you in that. Way. And you can ask all day, oh, I'm taking my kid up at the night. But yeah. anybody could say that. You know what I'm saying? But like, I still need to know who you are. I still need to know who you are. But like, I, my point is, if I say I'm taking my kid up at the nurse, right, and they let me in, the door to the school is still propped open. I still have access to the school. So I can give any excuse to be there, and I'm still able to get into the school. I, you're, you're saying this, the second door is yes. to go out, right? And, and so like, that's something we can look at too. Though. Like, is it should I have, uh, like maybe that door is the one I should get buzzed into, or do you think that's the key part or something? Like, yeah, actually, I will tell you the 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 high school has that. So um, that's a part of a building growing older and changing times. So it's true. The second door should have that. I imagine that will come out in the vulnerability assessment. But it's a good point. Sure. Mr. Cummins, are giving Mr. Vlada credit for what we did. No. <laughs> Actually, Larry brought that concern about the fifth grade wing and over the summertime, so we've been working on that. Megan, thanks for noticing. Appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, Chuck and Dennis. That, that was a problem last year, people ordering food. Okay, that was, that, that has been eliminated. So we actually have like student monitors at all four corners of the building, monitoring all sides of the building. Uh, myself or Chuck is outside during like the lunch and learn and the transition periods like that as well. Um, so it's, it's really been locked down. There's been no food coming. That has not been happening this year. Okay, we, we recognize it was a problem last year, and uh, you know they took the measures. And right now, it's it's, it's done very very well. Uh, so, we, there are people outside during those transition periods, keeping kids from walking off campus, and you know questioning people coming in. You know, but you're it, it is busy. Is it going to be perfect? No, it's not going to be perfect. But it, it's improved dramatically over the last couple of years. It really has. Anyone else? So yeah, we're looking for to do this with our staff is one of the uh, protocols with 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 um, to put um, tourniquet uh, and and actually chest seals um, uh, as well in our classrooms as a part of the go. That's some, that's our goal this year is to do that. Are you a trainer? No. Oh darn it! <laughs> All right, we're looking for one. If you know one, send them our way. Okay, I thank everybody for being here. Um, I promised my card to anyone who wants it. If you want to call me and have concerns, uh, please step up, introduce yourself, be glad to give it to you. Thank you for coming tonight, everybody.